So, Tomas, what do you think? Should we uh, celebrate pro wrestling for a little bit? Absolutely, we should. We are going to yeah. talk about a show, which honestly, I don't want to say it wasn't a priority for me, but this ended up being a sleeper show for me. It was in on the back. It was in the back of my mind. I knew I was going to watch it. I didn't think I was going to get to watch the majority of it live, uh, but I was able to hop back into the show like thirty minutes before, thirty minutes into the show, and what a damn good show we got! Damn good show. Um, I do have some minor nitpicks with it that we'll get to towards the end, but this is certainly oh, yeah. gonna this like a perfect show. But wrestling fans, Tomas, are getting spoiled in the year twenty twenty three. We've had some great shows from WWE year round. AEW put on a banger show that we were at, and now we have this one. And uh, I mean, all I can say is keep the quality coming. Keep it I coming. Mean- Last month, we got a WWE pay-per-view, an NXT show, and a AEW pay-per-view all in one weekend. Yeah. I, a 12-year-old me would have been an absolute love if he was a professional wrestling rap. Honestly, you don't take this stuff for granted, guys, because nope. in an age when we're full of elitist, of WWE is better, AEW is better, I don't give a shit. I'm here to watch pro wrestling, mm-hmm. and I'm not part of any camp. I have issues with both companies. But back in, like, middle school, you had me scrounging up change to buy WWE DVDs on Amazon. And now, yep. with just the click of a button, I am overwhelmed with wrestling. We got Raw, SmackDown, NXT, AEW, Impact. Ring of so Honor. Many shows, Ring of Honor on the weekly. That There's so much pro wrestling that's available that it makes your head spin. And yeah. <laughs> this, honestly, was probably the ultimate example of that because we have a crossover show ladies and gentlemen it's the yep. second annual aew versus new japan pro wrestling forbidden door this was a concept yes. last year that was made where basically aew and njpw got together and said let's have the best of the best go at you know go at each other it's you know, like an all-star like, series it's yeah, an all-star yeah. series i love it i love it so Okada, much and- will osprey I- zach saber jr uh, Tomohiro Ishii, all the yes. all the big names, all the heavy names are here tonight. Sonata, Tanahashi. I don't know if you said Tanahashi yet, but I'll also tell you that I'll also tell you that Forbidden Door is the best pay per view name that Tony Khan has come up with. I think it's just such a cool name. But I mean, I don't even think he came up with it. That kind of just fell into their laps because in the early mm-hmm. days of AEW, even with WWE, whenever a promotion would cross brand with each other, they'd call it opening the forbidden door because i feel like between the years of what 2006 all the way until 2020 people stayed on their side they you know people stayed in their lane you didn't you heard of like what if wwe faced tna what if wwe faced AEW? what if ring of honor fought tna but it was just so like frowned upon for promotions to do crossovers but now you got, you know, everybody's jumping everywhere nowadays. Like, one yeah. of my nitpicks is, what's the point of being all elite when AEW guys are showing up in New Japan? They're showing up on Strong. They're showing up, you know, in PWG. They're showing up in so yeah. many independent promotions that it's a free-for-all. Unless you're signed mm-hmm. to WWE, you can go wherever the fuck you want. Yeah, AEW, it's not really a binding contract when you sign with all elite wrestling. You can go to... PWG, you can go to freaking all pro wrestling over in uh, Hayward, California, very close, but like, <laughs> like you can go anywhere. You can go anywhere. And Tony Khan is allowing them that freedom. And a lot of wrestlers gravitate towards that. Um, and a lot of them like Brian Danielson, who jumped over a couple of years ago. One thing that was a big kicker for him not signing with WWE is he wanted to work with the Japanese guys and he wanted to test himself. And boy, yeah, howdy, and did have- he on this show. We have yet to see Danielson go to Japan to work a show. And unfortunately, last year, he was out due to a concussion, and he was supposed to wrestle Zack Sabre Jr. And it's been a year since Claudio Castagnoli has been with AEW, the current reigning Ring of Honor world champion. But honestly... Isn't that that crazy? Yeah. And this is one reason why I prefer this year's show over last year's show. We had little to no injuries, and everything went without a hitch. We Mm -hmm. had, like, four or five heavy hitters on you know, on the sidelines with injuries. And Adam Cole got injured at last year's Forbidden Door. And I feel yeah. like this is a cursed show for Adam Cole because he was supposed to fight Filthy Tom Lawler from New, New Japan Strong on the show. 
last minute match and Adam Cole went down with an illness. Hopefully he's doing well. And the match got scrapped. Um, they don't plan mm-hmm. on going back to that. But, you know, they crammed a lot onto this show. And there were they five, did. count them, five matches on the zero hour. I was <laughs> unable to catch those matches. Um, yeah. So looking at it, all of them, with the exception for one, were less than 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. Again, at AEW, Tony Khan, you booked a Ring of Honor show with 19 matches on it. <laughs> Quality over quantity, Mr. Khan. <laughs> so much. And, you know, people are poking fun because as of last week, you had uh, Excalibur running down the cards for next week's Dynamite, this Friday's Rampage, this Saturday's Collision, uh, Forbidden Door, the following week's Collision. It's just like, pump the brakes, Tony Khan. Like, mm-hmm. it's okay to pace yourself. <laughs> it's like, calm the fuck you know, down. You fucking okay. mark. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Like, yeah, it's... you know, you 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 basically Tony Khan is Charlie Bucket, and you just gave him the keys to the chocolate factory, and he is going absolutely crazy. And this card basically shows it. Just to run mm-hmm. down real quick, what happened? Filthy Tom Lawler did make the trip to Canada, so he was still in action. He defeated Serpentico uh, in a four minute match. You had the Mobile Embassy. Defeating Chaos, which is Rocky Romero, Chuck Taylor, Trent Beretta, and El Desperado in an eight-man tag team match. Athena, the Ring of Honor Women's World Champion, defeated Billy Starks in the opening round of the Owen Hart Cup Tournament. The women's side, El Fantasmo defeated Stu Grayson. And Los Ingranobes de Japón defeated United Empire. That's the only match I'm upset that I missed because Jeff Cobb was in that match. Um, Mm -hmm. Happy to see him still thriving. But yeah, if you got you know more than bang for your buck with this show and all five of those matches were free yep. this was not even into the main card so uh toronto got spoiled um that's another thing one year i would like to see forbidden door actually in japan yeah oh man could you imagine i mean aew is running a show at uh wembley um in august so there's honestly there's no reason that's that's so right like you should be able to see Forbidden Door overseas in Japan. So I feel like it's going to happen one of these years. Uh, and Maybe. New- there's there's turf. a couple factors. I feel like they need to let this concept grow a little more because if they would want to book, let's say, the Tokyo Dome, they would want to pack that building to the brim. And I think this idea needs to grow more before they can do it. And also, I think Tony Khan doesn't want us Americans to have to stay up till 2 in the morning to watch such a show. So again, Probably. there's... There's time for them to dabble in ideas, but, you know, we're talking about tiny little nitpicks. This was a fantastic show. And oh, this so opener, freaking good. This opener proves how, how stacked this card is. So let's get into it. AEW Forbidden Door 2023, live from the Scotiabank Arena in Toronto, Canada, a great wrestling city, often called Bizarro World by a lot of people. But we open with an AEW World Heavyweight Championship match. You heard me right, viewers. AEW World title is on the line in the first match on the card. I believe that's the first time in history that's happened in an AEW short lifespan. Maxwell Jacob Friedman, the piece of shit himself, defending it against the ace Hiroshi Tanahashi. MJF walks to the ring. Then his robe on the back, it reads, New Japan is an indie. And then when he takes off the robe, his elbow pad said, Ace is ass. I'm like... MJF (laughs) knows how to rub all the marks the wrong way. MJF Mm -hmm. is a genius. MJF is pulling a Brock Lesnar, a Roman Reigns, and he demanded to Tony Khan, if he's not going on last, he's going on first. He sure did. he basically wanted to get this match out of the way, get the hell out of Canada. Uh, There was another (laughs) point I wanted to make. You wanted to get the hell out of Canada. Also, real quick, because these a lot of these matches didn't have too much build. Uh, the build to this one was basically Tanahashi wanted to challenge MJF for the world title. MJF told Tanahashi to fuck off. Uh, Tanahashi has kind of been communicating with MJF through pre-recorded video packages. And MJF has his hands full with Adam Cole right now on Dynamite. Bay bay. Tanahashi challenges MJF for the world title. MJF says no. Adam Cole basically says, what are you, a pussy? and goads MJF into accepting the world championship match uh, because MJF is better than you, and you know it. Um, Specifically calling MJF a coward, I should note. And MJF did wrestle Adam Cole in a non-title match on Dynamite that did go to a draw. 
So those two are going to be wrestling probably at Wembley, if I had to guess. I mean, part of me wants to see Adam Cole be the one to take the belt from MJF, spoiler, but who knows? Who knows what's going to happen once that time comes? So this was a very, very, solid, very solid opening contest yeah. here. It's not my favorite MJF title match. Obviously, that's obviously that's always going to go to the Iron Man match from Revolution. Well, he was th- these guys were only given 15 minutes for this match and i feel like for an aew world title match you definitely have to push 20 minute mark but they we were. have two world title matches uh, an iwgp united states championship match and a dream match in okada and danielson later on in the night so i understand i don't want to say they were pushing the world title down but it wasn't a priority on the show this just goes to show how stacked this match was yeah if you still well, don't think mjf is a good professional wrestler you are wrong at this point because MJF was in there with Tanahashi. You know, he looked like a pro in there. And I don't understand why people think MJF is not a pro. He's not a rookie. He's been doing this for 15 plus years. Mm-hmm. He is the true definition of a professional wrestler. And if he is wrestling your jimmies, then MJF is just doing his job right. So by that logic, MJF has been wrestling since he, since he was 12 years old. <laughs> it's been a long week ladies and gentlemen yeah. <laughs> no it's fair it's fair but uh anyway mjf is selling his bum fucking knee as he called it at the revolution press screening uh he uh you know he gets his knees up on a tanahashi splash and he's selling it like a complete crybaby bitch uh i don't okay all due respect to tanahashi one of the greatest japanese wrestlers of all time 46 years old at this point and Honestly, it kind of looks like he was slowing down a little bit in there. And it wasn't like it wasn't it's not like he's putting on a bad match here per se. But when you look at these two and where they're at in their careers, it is so abundantly clear that MJF is going over. Just because like if Tanahashi were to win this title, which again, I feel like is good continuity cuz Tanahashi was challenging for the vacant AEW title last year at Forbidden Door with John Moxley. But at this point, MJF is on a roll. He needed to keep it going. So I feel like that made the match a bit predictable. A good comparison here would be like ECW One Night Stand, 05 and 06, especially 06, because if you look on the matches on paper, they're very good matches. Vince McMahon was not going to let Sabu take the world title off of Rey Mysterio. No. And Sabu was not going to jump to WWE and defend that world championship on a regular basis. So if you look at it in hindsight, Tanahashi, who is comfortably in Japan and one of Japan's biggest stars, if he were to take the AEW world title, that means he would need to take more trips to the state on a regular basis. And a lot of these guys in New Japan, a reason why they are not signing with AEW and WWE is they don't want to move to the States. Will Ospreay has made it very clear he is not willing to move to the U.S. He is very comfortable in Japan. Uh, he does not want to go to AEW and work the U.S. circuit. He does not want to go to WWE and work that hectic U.S. circuit. Mm. It's, you know, it's not very, um, it, it, it's not very favorable to these guys. So when you look at it on hindsight, yeah, it's very predictable. But I think, and a big theme of tonight is a lot of these matches are not spot fest. They're not spotty. They're all about telling mm-hmm. the story. And I think the story they were trying to tell here was, Tanahashi is so fucking over. He made MJF to kind of look like the underdog. And MJF had to prove here once again that he can hang with a guy like Tanahashi. And he sure did. He sure did. MJF and his heel tactics. I freaking loved it. He has Tanahashi in an abdominal stretch at one point, and he's using the top rope for leverage. And (laughs) Bryce Remsburg, referee Bryce Remsburg, like he makes this moment because he like keeps looking over towards the rope where MJF is holding onto it. And MJF quickly puts his hand back on his hip and he's like, the f- what the fuck do you want, dipshit? I didn't do anything. And he, like, Bryce Remsburg finally catches MJF using the rope, and he kicks his arm off. And I'm like, the referee's getting involved here. But I freaking yeah. loved it. Freaking loved and, it. You know, Tanahashi is New Japan's John Cena. Mm-hmm. So I think the goal here was to just get Tanahashi over more in the States. And honestly, these guys are really putting each other over. There was a huge superplex near the end of the match. That looked pretty devastating. Both guys took that very well. Um, the finish of the match, you know, in true John Cena fashion, uh, MJF hits a heat seeker for a very close fall. 
Um, the referee is distracted for a bit um, off of ref, what was a ref bump or a, how did the ref get distracted? Um, so before that, I should know that Tanahashi had MJF in a Texas clover leaf for a while. Um, MJF got his knees up off the high fly flow, his version of a frog splash. MJF grabs the AEW championship, goes into the ring with it. And Bryce Remsburg does take the championship away. Tanahashi tries to get a victory roll, but Tanahashi was arguing with the referee. Tanahashi is shoved into Bryce Remsburg, which gives MJF enough time to pull out the diamond ring. Smack Tanahashi right in the face and retain the title after 15 minutes. It was a really solid opening contest. I'm yeah. going to give it three and a half stars. I really was a good. little, had been annoyed with that finish, but after I had time to collect myself, in hindsight, Tanahashi is not going down clean. Again, he is New Japan's John Cena. And mm -hmm. MJF is a fucking heel. If you don't like the heel champion cheating to win, then you must not have liked Roddy Roddy Piper. You must nope. not have liked Jackson <laughs> Sheep. You know, you must not have loved all of these classic heels back to the Must Ted not have Yossi. liked William Regal. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Heels cheat to win. It is not a heel's job to win in the most flashy way. So mm -hmm. if you didn't like that finish, then you must not like clean, uh, classic heel tactics. Again, I'm going to give this three and a half stars. This was a very fun match. I think MJF hung with Tanahashi very well. Tanahashi made him look great. MJF, they both, mm -hmm. both these guys made each other look really good in this match. They absolutely did. I think they had pretty good chemistry. Again, it's not necessarily MJF's best match in his reign so far. Far from it, I think. But for what it was, I think it did its job and it was solid. I can't wait to see where MJF goes next. Yeah. So the same kind of matchups uh, Tanahashi has also before he hangs it up for good. I hate to say that MJF and Tanahashi is just a forgettable blip on MJF's radar in his world title reign. But again, uh, it, this was an opening match uh, kind of thrown together. They were not going to put the world title on Tanahashi. And the cherry on top of this Sunday is MJF is making his way back up the ramp. He looks at the camera again and says, Tony Khan, where's my competition? This is getting too easy. He brushed off Tanahashi like he was nothing. Mm-hmm. Ace is ass in his words. Speaking of ass. <sighs> okay. Um, before we get into this match, so this is the opening round uh, match of the Owen, Hup, Owen, Hart, Owen Hart Cup Tournament. This is the second annual one. Miss and you all, it is Satoshi Kojima taking on CM Punk. Now, okay, let's open up this can of snakes. Let me get this out of the way right now. I am going to get – no stone is going to be unturned in this podcast. I am no. going to get – all of my feelings out of the way about CM Punk, this whole situation, my feelings about it. But after this is all, after this podcast, I'm going to say this right now. I do not have the mental energy to keep putting into this situation. I do not have the patience for the situation anymore. It is no secret that I do not like CM Punk. It is no secret that I detest this man. I liked his WWE run all the way throughout the pipe bomb. And then he left. Um, at first, I was rubbed the wrong way about CM Punk's departure. The Colt Cabana podcast came out, and I'm going to admit, I jumped on the bandwagon. I jumped on the CM Punk bandwagon, the fuck WWE, they did him wrong. And I'm not saying but one side is, you know, more right than the other. But as the years went on, and after that podcast dropped, I couldn't help but think to myself, why are we riding this guy's nuts? Why are we hanging on this guy's every single word? And why are we treating him like he's the messiah of professional wrestling? He's so I really, started, I really started to see through. I started to see how transparent Punk is. And as I continued on watching wrestling between the years, I want to say 2015 and 2020, I started realizing guys like Seth Rollins, AJ Styles, Brian Danielson, Matt Riddle, Gunter, uh, John Moxley, Gargano, Champa, Owens, Zane, uh, Roman. You said Moxley already, right? Yeah, but we could. Uh, Zack Saber Jr. Um, Claudio. We could fucking list off names until we are blue in the face, and the night is young. Mm -hmm. And I realized that this guy is an overrated piece of shit, and I was really yeah. tired of hearing about him. I did not want him back in the re in the wrestling business. And then 2021 rolled around. No, 2020 rolled around. 
and CM Punk was on the backstage show on Fox. So there was kind of a rumbling, may Punk come back to WWE. Then the pandemic happened. Let me get this out of the way right now. If the pandemic never happened, I truly believe CM Punk would have came back to WWE. Oh, then yeah. 2021 rolled around. And there were rumblings, there were rumors that AEW got CM Punk. I will admit, my interest was peaked. I was willing to give this a chance. I watched the second episode of Rampage, and I, that, I will admit that was a magical moment. To see CM Punk return to professional wrestling after eight years. The dude crying in the stands. Like, you know, yeah. that's become a gifable moment until the cows come home. And I'll agree with you. It was a magical moment. And Tomas, I'm sure you're going to get into this, but I was willing to give Punk another chance after everything that he had been through. You know, I was curious to see what he would do. He had a solid match against Darby Allen at the greatest AEW pay-per-view of all time, mind you, all out 2021. He goes and he fights Eddie Kingston. That's a pretty solid blood feud. And the feud with MJF ended in the dog collar match, a revolution of 22. Awesome stuff. That's why I'll agree with you. I was willing to give him another chance. I was ready to give him another chance. I was like, you know what? Everyone deserves a second chance. Let's go. I'm back on the punk bandwagon. I would admit I was one of those people that immediately jumped on pro wrestling tees and bought that CM Punk shirt. It's still in my closet. Now it's never going to see the light of day ever again. No. And yeah, he had a good match with Darby Allen, a good match with Eddie Kingston. Nothing spectacular, nothing mind blowing, but I was appreciating the work. But then Punk had a match that really just flipped the switch with me. He wrestled Wardlow, and Wardlow beat the piss out of this man, power bombed him. I'm not kidding, maybe at least 10 times. And CM mm-hmm. Punk rolled the motherfucker up and still beat him. And that's yeah. when it clicked with me that CM Punk has no fucking right pinning all these guys. He's pinning Eddie. He's pinning Allen. He's pinning Wardlow. He's pinning every single person in his path. And that's when I started getting a little annoyed. Mm -hmm. I get it. He's a big star. I get it. You want to keep him strong. But I feel like this is not his roster to bury. No. I'm not pulling any punches here. I'm sticking to every single word I'm saying here. This was not his roster to bury. Absolutely not. He feuded for the AEW world title. And he won it. Relevant because Hangman Adam Page said something in his promo that I wholeheartedly agreed with. I'm not defending the AEW world title against you. I'm defending the AEW roster from you. And it's haunting. It's haunting listening to that promo and what he said and everything that happened afterwards. Um, So Punk would go on to win the AEW world title. And I was not happy. This was not his company to be the world champion. He wants the main event shows, sure. He wants to have main event feuds, fine. But I think the AEW world title was taking it a little too far. Now, before anyone says anything, I understand that Punk himself said he did not want to be world champion. They still put the title on him. And once again, he's on this pedestal that I do not think he deserved to be on. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of shit started going down. I'm going to summarize it because I feel like we went into detail with this in other podcasts. He got injured. He got injured. The interim world title bullshit happened. Moxley's champion. Moxley drops. Moxley buries Punk on an episode of Dynamite. Punk wins the fucking title back. Punk gets injured again. Punk cuts the most disrespectful promo of all time in a fucking desk with muffins in front of him, treating his boss like he's a fucking dog. Yeah, and the thing is, uh, he came off so freaking unprofessional in that moment. Uh, because nobody had asked him about Cole Cabana. He decided to get up there and just start ranting about this guy. And he's calling the EVPs, you know, so irresponsible they couldn't manage a target. And it started a whole backstage kerfuffle. Brawl out is what it's known as. I'm sure you've heard of it. Bears were thrown. Wrestling... People were bit. Apparently a dog was injured. Biggest wrestling know? biggest mm-hmm. wrestling scandal since the Montreal screw job, right? So the guy that caused all this, you would think you'd never see him again in AEW. And I remember explicitly saying on that all out podcast, well, guys, I hope you enjoyed your one year of CM Punk because you're never going to see him in that ring ever again. Never. He got injured. He got suspended. And throughout all of this stuff, it's like, you know, looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. And I knew at that point, Punk had not changed one bit 
over these past 10 years. No. And I'm done with this guy. I'm truly done with this guy. And all this, this drama that's been going on here, who started what? And I'm just like, if I were to pull this shit at my job, which ironically I work at a Target, I would be fired and it'd probably be hard for me to ever find work ever again. Yeah. And they let this guy back in. They let him back in. Little to no punishment. If Here's the thing. If I were Tony Khan and I was in this situation, I put my big boy pants on and I would tell Punk, you want to come back here? You're going to stand in front of this entire fucking locker room and apologize to them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm going to force you and the elite into a room and you guys are going to be fucking adults and apologize to each other. You yeah. don't have to talk to each other. You don't guys don't have to be best friends. And I'm not saying one camp is right over the other. I'm, I'm completely neutral on this. I know the young bucks are assholes. I know Hangman Adam Page does his own thing and that rubs people the wrong way. The only person I truly think is innocent in all this is Kenny Omega. Yeah. But it just, it disgusts me that Punk did all this shit and then they just brought him back. And I'm just like, I'm done with this guy. I did not watch the first episode of Collision. From here on out on Dynamite Collision, I am skipping anything CM Punk related. He's right in there with the Hardy Boys. But Mm -hmm. pay-per-views are a little different instant. I'm not a child. I'm not going to close my eyes and plug my ears and say, la, 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 I'm punks. I'm going to watch. But this leads to this. From here on out, because I have no energy left to bitch and moan and whine about CM Punk. I don't like him. I never will like him again. I would really appreciate it if he just fucked off and never came back to pro wrestling ever again. If you're a punk fan, if you're a punk fan, fine, whatever. But from here on out, if he is on pay-per-view, I will review the match respectfully and professionally and unbiased as possible. If he has a good match, I'm going to say it's a good match. If he has a bad match, I'm going to say it's a bad match. I'm not going to sit here and bury this guy. He wrestled, so he comes out and Toronto is fucking booing him out of the building. Number one, because Excalibur said, well, looks like we're not in Chicago anymore. Because every single other fucking arena, I'm sure, is going to do the right thing and boo this guy. I mean, like, if, if it was... You if you punk, more power to you. If it was... More if, power to you. Hold on. If it was really the right thing, and this goes to everybody watching an AEW show, if you guys really do not want CM Punk on your television ever again, just don't react to him. Just don't react. Because that... It ain't that... going to happen, though, man. <sighs> it ain't going to happen. All right. It ain't going right. to happen. It, it ain't going to happen. And, you know, that's the thing. That's like, what they're looking for, though. That's what they're looking for. You know, they're looking for people to either boo or cheer CM Punk. And, you know, as long as he gets a reaction, hey, bravo. He's still captivating television. If nobody reacts to him, then they can, oh, yeah, fuck him. Yeah, let's blackball you know him from what? the business. And here's the thing. I got curious. I got tempted. And, you know, people said, oh, Punk cut a promo on Collision. I was like, oh, no, I'm not doing that. Punk had an interview with ESPN. I don't care anymore. I don't care about this man baby and all the shit he's going to continue to complain about. And you know what? This is the last thing I'm going to say before I go into professional mode. He's going to fuck up again. And I'm going to be right here to say, I told you so. Garen fucking Same. He will fuck Same. up again. He absolutely will. And that will be the straw that broke the camel's back. As if Brawl Out was not the straw that broke the camel's back already. Because that should have been it. So yeah. Punk comes out. He is booed. Kenny Omega is from Canada, so everybody knows how much of a prick CM Punk is. And he goes in there and he touches the Owen Hart Cup trophy, and I'm sure Owen Hart would have been puking if he was watching this and alive today to see that. But Because Punk only cares about himself. Uh, he goes in there and Satoshi Kojima carries him to a decent match. Um, and then Punk, um, Punk, Punk <laughs> is really leaning into the heel stuff because AEW... He better be. He better be. <laughs> um, they realize what a situation this is, and I think you know they know he's going to get booed. So I think it is a smart thing to turn him heel. Um, there's no point in trying to pass him off as a baby face if 90% of the crowd isn't going to like him. Time out. He's now a... time out. So if he is supposed to be a heel, why is he teaming with FTR? Why is he teaming because with Ricky they were Starks? In Chicago. Because they were in Chicago. Does does it matter? Does it matter if they're in Chicago? They if he Here's if the they want to if they want to portray him as a heel, Tomas, they have to team him up with freaking like. Listen, Zach, you have to be okay. Reasonable. They have to a- officially turn him heel before they can do stuff. They were testing the waters, and they he wasn't going to get booed in Chicago, so they had to play right. towards that. 
you know, demographic, once they get on, there will be an official heel turn. You can't just assume someone is healed because you have personal feelings. You know how many people hated John Cena over the past 20 years? <sighs> that was going to be my next thing. That was going to be my next thing. So no, I'm just saying, if you hate John Cena, that doesn't automatically make him heal because they weren't booking him as a heel. When they start see, booking Punk as a heel, and that's going to happen probably this Wednesday, if anything, mm-hmm. it, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. CM Punk has become what he hates. He has become the New York Yankees. All right? That's that's all I'm going to say. Um, so um, Punk, Punk pins Kojima after I don't even know how long this match went. It, like, uh, let's see, 13 minutes? That's way too long for CM Punk now. He hits him um, with hideous GTS. I, I, think I, 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 I want to talk a little bit about this match because I didn't hate this match. Um, I thought it was a decent, fun match. Um. A lot of people were giving shit to Kojima going into this match because he's 52 years old. Uh, you know, a lot of ages for this man. And Kojima Bro. went out there and he looked very good. He is stiff as fuck. He was laying those chops in pretty damn good. He was laying in those elbows really d- damn good. Um, Punk was selling for him very well. Um, but a lot of heel tactics from Punk, a lot of fucking with Kojima and Kojima just going back with, you know, the stiff elbows. A Punk did hit a very sloppy GTS, and that's another thing I'll say about Punk that just adds to my, to my, to my, you know, to my case. He ever since he returned, uh, he's been very sloppy in the ring. Very, very, very sloppy in the ring. So if he is as sloppy as he is, Tomas, why does Tony Khan bring him back? Like I'm Tony s- Khan loves him. I I don't understand it. Satoshi Kojima carried him to a pretty decent match. The highest I can go is two and a half. I'm going to give this two and three quarter because I really did enjoy the stiffness of this match. And this match was a lot better than I expected it to be. Um, Punk going forward in the finals. Um, if you look at the brackets, he's going to face the winner of Samoa Joe and Roderick Strong. I fully expect Samoa Joe to win that match. Punk and Joe is going to be interesting because I could see either man going over. Um, but in all honesty, looking at it from a logical point of view, my tournament finals are CM Punk and Ricky Starks with Ricky Starks going over. This is without personal feeling. This is just how I feel. Regardless, pre-brawl out, this is not a tournament for Punk to be winning. This is a tournament for a brand new person to win. This is going to be a notch in Ricky Starks' belt that he really needs. And yeah, again, totally professional here going out. He has a good match. He has a good match. He has a bad match. He has a bad match. He's not going to be put on a pedestal anymore. Last thing before we move on, because I know we've spent a lot of time on this. What happens when Punk actually wins the tournament and pins Ricky Starks clean in the middle? I hope he doesn't, but I will say... You know he's going to. (laughs) You know he's going to. Like, why would they bring... Like, why would CM Punk want to come back if he's like... No, I'm just going to freaking put over the young guys, you know? Well, <laughs> like, he also on. did a despicable act, and I'm pretty sure Tony Khan would at least be that much. Notice that he has been pushed down the card. He is not being featured in main event spots. They, uh, they, they Honestly, I think this is his punishment. All right. All right. I'll believe. But like I said. I'll believe it when I see it. Totally unbiased going from here on out. He's just another wrestler. Um, Again. Him and the Hardy Boys, I don't watch their shit anymore. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, uh, huh. yeah, let's, uh, let me just recompose myself because we're talking about something really good coming up next. Four-way match for the International Championship. The workhorse, ironically, of AEW, Orange Cassidy, the laziest worker on the roster in gimmick, is defending against Zack Sabre Jr., Katsuyori Shibata, and Daniel Garcia. Kind of full circle after Shibata and Cassidy had their moment at last year's Forbidden Door when Shibata was introduced to AEW fans. Uh, <laughs> fucking Orange Cassidy does his uh, the the lethal kicks, the shin kicks that nearly took the guys out of their shoes to start off the um, match. I'm, I'm surprised they could keep going. I was not upset, but a little bummed that this wasn't, wasn't Orange Cassidy versus Zack Sabre Jr. one-on-one because those two would have put on a phenomenal match. Um, mm-hmm. But I understand they're trying to get everybody on this card, at least everybody with a big name. Um, I feel like Garcia and Shibata were kind of shoehorned in this at the last second after a tag team match on Dynamite a couple weeks ago. 
Um, Shibata, everyone knows about him. The headbutt hurt around the world that almost killed him. Mm -hmm. Is back in wrestling after only a few years. Uh, everybody in this match has a title except Garcia. Zack Saber Jr. is the New Japan Television Champion, and Shibata is the Ring of Honor Pure Champion, which we were there to see him win that title. Yeah, back at uh, back at uh, Death Before Dishonor. Super card. Um, Super card of honor. Thank you. A lot of <laughs> Ring of Honor shows with the word honor in them. Right. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I want to praise um, Zack Sabre Jr. Because I mentioned this at last year's Forbidden Door. As much of an endearing babyface Zack Sabre Jr. can be, he is a fucking douchey heel. And he has really just sunk his teeth into this ever since yeah. last year. He has been a heel running roughshod over... In, uh, in New Japan, and he even has perfected the douchebag 2001 blonde frosted tip look. He oh, just, God. How to piss people off. <laughs> frosted fucking tips. Yeah, no, like, he comes off like a freaking prep boy that you hate every time you go to, like, a college party, you know? Like, <laughs> it's just, like, it's horrible. So, um, Daniel Garcia was the only one in this match without a title, and the way that Daniel Garcia is freaking dancing in the ring when Shibata and Sabre Jr. are having an intense beatdown. I don't know, man. Garcia just didn't really fit with me. And there was a point where I thought Garcia was going to be the one to dethrone Chris Jericho to become the ROH world champion. But that did not happen, obviously. Um, Garcia has been a floater. He's been a floater ever since they pulled the plug on the Chris Jericho feud. Him. Uh, Sabre Jr. was rumored, and Shibata, like I said, it comes full circle with him returning last year. Um, him competing against Orange Cassidy, and Orange Cassidy donning the glasses on him to make that full circle. So, again, I feel like they were trying to just fit everyone on the card, but this was a really, really, really fun match. Really Zach fun. Sabre Jr. is called the technical wizard for a reason. He has so many submission holes in his arsenal that I swear this guy just pulls out of his ass. God um, damn. Yeah, twisting Orange Cassidy like a freaking pretzel in the middle of the ring is just like, it's wild what he can do with people's bodies. And like the fact that like the shoulder bends back the way it does, I'm like, man. You know, everybody <laughs> talks about the way Pete Dunne snaps fingers. Why is no one talking about the way Zack Sabre Jr. almost rips your fucking arm out of your socket and just rips off those digits one by one? He is, he is, a, he, I, I love him. I'm and wondering. I'm wondering yeah. if in real life, Zack Sabre, in another in another universe, I'm wondering if Zack Sabre Jr. would become a chiropractor and be a revolutionary freaking like, oh man, yeah, this is how you heal your shoulder. This is how you Miracle do it this way. Worker. <laughs> Could if you super powers were real, he would totally have a healing factor. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Shibata and Cassidy exchanging chops in the middle of the ring while they're sitting crisscross applesauce in front of each other because remember, guys, the gimmick is that Orange Cassidy is supposed to be lazy. But the fact is, Cassidy has defended his title so many freaking times since he won it last October. Like This is defense number 25. Holy fucking shit, man. Uh, I love... I love just those work... You know, uh, we, we've been talking a lot about the gimmicks these past couple years, long title runs, undefeated. I love... My, my favorite gimmick is... The, the workhorse champion the mm -hmm. champion defending every single fucking week uh i know the open challenge gimmick has really worn out its welcome oh yeah well the are, I, I just love it I, I just are doing it right. it's so funny it's so funny because like orange cassidy's gimmick is he's supposed to be the workhorse fighting champion but then at the same time his presentation is he's the freaking like sloth of the roster. He comes out with a little sparkler, just one measly little firework while he throws his uh you know, his measly little thumb up <laughs> and it's uh, he cool carries the here. he carries cool the here. international title uh is carried to the ring in a Jansport backpack. Uh <laughs> it's like it's the funniest thing. Um, so he's hitting his greatest hits, of course. Beach Break, Orange Punch. This is really, really good stuff. Uh, Shibata hits a PK kick on Garcia, and then Orange Cassidy hooks the arms of Garcia to pin him in a victory roll out of nowhere. Fast-paced 12-minute four-way. I'm giving it four stars. This was really fun. Really I'm fun. I'm four and a quarter stars. I had so Ooh. much fun with this match. This was fantastic. I love every single person in this match. And again, I don't get to see a lot of Zack Sabre Jr. as much as I would like to. So it's very fast paced. A, yeah. It, mm -hmm. It's always a treat to see him wrestle. And again, if you can get Zack Sabre Jr. to make another trip to the States, 
please one on one. I need to see mm. Cassidy and Saber Jr. one on one. Yeah, my biggest nitpick with this match is actually, ironically, Daniel Garcia using a weapon, the ROH Pure Title, on Katsuyori Shibata, but the no disqualification rule was never addressed. Other than that, and theoretically, if if, if Shibata is hit in the skull. A fractured skull, which almost killed him a few years ago. If Garcia hits him in the head with a brass title like that, like how does that not beat Shibata right there? Like, you know, if they wanted to do like true New Japan rules, but they couldn't because this is the AEW International Title, uh, they could have <clears> did you, you use a weapon and you are out of the match. Mm -hmm. They would do that. But again, there were matches on this card that we'll get into that were New Japan rules. And I think that only qualifies mm -hmm. for the New Japan titles. Like the next match. Like the next match. This was a match that I really was not... I wasn't thinking of this match when it happened, but I was pleasantly surprised with what we got. It is Sonata defending his New Japan Pro Wrestling World Heavyweight Championship against Jungle Boy Jack Perry. Can you believe that the New Japan World title was just put up in an open challenge? Sonata showed up on video and said... Anyone wants the title shot, come and get it. Jungle Boy Jack Perry is the one to accept the challenge for the World Championship. He asked Hook, his friend, to be in his corner for this match. And Sonata, I don't know if this was kayfabe or not, absolutely buries Jack Perry in an interview, basically saying, I have no idea who this Jungle Boy kid is. How is someone like that challenging for my title? If it's kayfabe, perfect. If it's not, then you just bury this kid 800 feet in the ground, and there is no way for him to come back. Wow. I really hope that was kayfabe. Well, well, he's here. Kind of deserves it. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, this match was really good. Um, the crowd was not fully into it at first. They decided to chant for the referee instead and red shoes. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like... Hey, he's the Earl Hebner of Japan. Of course he's you over. Have, you have Sonata and Jungle Boy about to put on a clinic, and you're chanting for the referee? Like... You know, oh, and might I add, it carried over from uh, the previous year's Forbidden Door pay per view. You had the dual ring announcers, Justin Roberts, of course, representing AEW, and the new Japan ring announcer stealing the show right next to him with his intros. It's so freaking yes. good. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I said that match wrong. Sonata versus Jungle Boy Jacker. I mean, Sonata! <laughs> And uh, oh, Jack Perry! And then yep. in Japan, apparently they say the names backwards that I noticed. Shibata Katsuyori! Tanahashi Hiroshi! <laughs> oh, my favorite mm -hmm. was when he did MJF. MJF! Mm hmm. Um, but yeah, this was really good, Tomas, wouldn't you say? Yeah, Sonata is a fucking stud. He mm -hmm. towered over Jungle Boy in this match. And that's the thing. I love the story that they told this match. Because in this match, Sonata was basically, get this pipsqueak out of my ring. He has no right to be mm -hmm. even this close to my New Japan World title. And he was not taking Jack Perry seriously at all. He was throwing him around, shoving him around. My favorite spot in the match, and it would make more sense, you know, a little later on, is that um, Jungle Boy had done his homework and he tries to lock the Paradise Lock on his Sonata. But Sonata escapes because that's his hold. And if you don't know mm -hmm. what the Paradise Lock is, he basically twists your arms and legs around each other, like twists the arms around the ankles, and he basically puts you in a position where you can't fucking move. Commentary basically. is an excellent way of describing this. They said, if you move the arms, your legs are going to tighten up. If you move your legs, your arms are going to tighten up. So Jungle Boy mm -hmm. looked like a fucking <clears throat> pump in this spot because he is just wiggling around trying to get his way out of this, and Sonata is taking his sweet ass time with this. He is Love this. squaring up his kick. He's, you know, getting his leg ready and he runs and he kicks Jungle Boy right in the back. It's a great spot. Mm -hmm. uh, the New Loved Japan Pit fans get a huge kick out of it. Um, but I love the story that they were telling. Like Jungle Boy was like, it was like David versus Goliath. Like nobody thought to... that this little David with the slingshot was going to beat this big Goliath in Sonata. Trying to outsmart him any way he could. Now hear me out on this comparison. Just watching Sonata and how he worked in the ring, I almost feel like he could be the IWGP or New Japan answer to what The Rock was back in the day. Now, hear me out. Mm -hmm. Hear me out. Because he's obviously not as big as The Rock. <laughs> you know, obviously. You know, like, The Rock has, like, 50 pounds on this guy. But it's his mannerisms. 
and the way he like carries himself in the ring. Sonata has an immense amount of charisma and he's got such a great look to him. You know, you know he's a I'm stud. Make another he's a stud. A very relatable, you know, comparison. <clears throat> when Reigns and Sonata, that's what a fucking world champion should carry himself like. He is mm-hmm. the best in the world. And again, the way Sonata was carrying himself like, only the elite, no pun intended, should be challenging for my title. What's this little pip squeak in a loincloth doing in my ring? So mm-hmm. it was, I, I love the story that they were telling in this match. And yeah. Jungle Boy gave Sonata a run for his money. He was able to get the snare trap in at one point. He was able, he was close to the start of the match. Holds. Yeah. He was trying to get different submission holds on the Sonata to, you know, get him to tap out. But it was too much for him to overcome because Sonata is just a fucking stud. Oh, he sure is. He sure is. Um, but my big issue with the match is I thought the ending was a bit anticlimactic. Uh, they worked for 11 minutes. Sonata pins Jungle Boy and retains with a moonsault. Um, a lot of people were looking at it thinking Jungle Boy forgot to kick out. But no, that was the planned finish. That was the planned yeah, finish. I, I will see there because there was a really close near fall before that. And then Sonata just brushes it off and he goes for a moonsault again. And he goes for a moonsault. Not the best looking moonsault. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, no Christopher Daniels moonsault. But he's able to get Jungle Boy. <laughs> the with best pin. moonsault ever. Get again. out of here. In hindsight, Jungle Boy had no chance to win this title because even if he did, that means he would have to go to Japan. That yeah. wasn't going to happen. Um, but that wasn't the big story. Um, I'm going to save my rating until after what we talk about here because yeah. this was something mm-hmm. that came totally out of left field. People were kind of, you know, hinting at this, kind of projecting it. I knew it was going to happen. I just didn't think it was going to happen on this show, and I didn't think it was going to happen in the way that it did. So uh, Hook was a non-factor in this match. He was there merely for support. And mm. when Jungle Boy and Hook are making their way back up the entrance, uh, Hook raises Jungle Boy's hand, and Jungle Boy knocks him out. Takes his freaking head off of the clothesline, doesn't he? Finally gives Hook something to do after, like, about a year, you know, since he first got over in this company. Um, let me just say for the record that Christian Cage was right all along. Jungle Boy is a selfish son of a bitch now, and he's looking out to the crowd, and he's doing the Tarzan Boy hand wave, and he's like, why are you booing me? And I'm like, basically snapped. Well, why not? Why not? You just knocked out your friend for no reason after the match, out of just sheer frustration, practically, you know? (laughs) And he's looking out at the crowd, and I'm like, damn, this is going to be interesting. This is going to be a really interesting character. First of all, this put Hook over like a mother, as Booker T would say. I feel like mm-hmm. this finally put Hook back on course, and it made him look like the biggest baby face ever, because ever, he got so much sympathy after that spot. Um, Jungle Boy's gimmick, I feel like ever since the Four Pillars four match, four-way match, his, um, his, his flaws have really been showing through. Um, it really shows that he's not a strong promo guy. He, a lot of his charisma is not there. I don't know what happened. Like he's been like in a, in a real bad slump in his career ever since mm-hmm. Double or Nothing and that build to Double or Nothing. And a lot of people were clamming for it, me included, that maybe it's time to drop the Jungle Boy persona and it's time for him to go heal. And I think this is the exact refresher that Jack Perry needs to put him back onto the, you know, onto the path of success. My only nitpick is, Jungle Boy grabs the FW, FTW title and raises it in front of uh, Hook's face. And storyline, I get it. Jungle Boy wants a fucking title. He failed the mm-hmm. AEW World title. He failed at the New Japan World Heavyweight title. He wants a title, and he's willing to even screw over his best friends to get a title. But when is the last time the FTW title has been relevant? Oh, man, dude. I, I have no idea. But if rumors are to be believed, and if they're true, that Hook may be on his way out and going to the big dub and taking Taz with him. And Taz, by the way, sold this so well on commentary because Jungle Boy just basically took out his son right in front of him. And Taz was like, you son of a bitch. You know, like it's the most probably the most emotional I've ever heard Taz as a color commentator. Like, which is saying a lot because I grew up with Taz as a color commentator. And it's just it's crazy to hear that has done an excellent job of staying unbiased in his son's career. He understands that his son needs to fight his own battles. But, I mean, I know we are... A faction is different. When I heard the rumors of Hook going to WWE and Taz being interested in going with him, 
Taz needs to be his son's mouthpiece because he we does. don't hear Hook talk a lot. He's a strong, silent type. And I think it needs to stay that way because mm-hmm. if this kid is green on the mic, Taz is one of the best promos in, in history of the business. It's, yes. it's go together like hand in hand. I don't want to see Taz get too involved in this feud because um, I feel like it's not really his fight. But no. again, if, if he wants to be his son's mouthpiece, I think it's going to be a match made in heaven. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, I'm not a huge fan of the F- – I, I don't want the FTW title to be a factor because this title has been a prop for Hook that he's been carrying around for over a year. The it's FTW, a gimmick. Yeah, the FTW title is not even an officially recognized title in AEW. No, it's it's never been a recognized title. Brian Cage has held it. Ricky Starks has held it. Uh, did Powerhouse Hobbs hold it? I feel like he no, did. No. no, he didn't. Okay, Everyone but... in Team Taz except Hobbs. Mm-hmm. So, oh man, that's kind of disrespectful, don't you think? But... I'm going to give this match four stars. This was an, mm. this really took me by surprise. I love the story that they told. Um, it was a nice surprise. And honestly, it, the match, honestly, three and three quarter, that last segment bumped it up to four. Was... I'm going to go, I'm going to go three and three quarter, mainly because I feel like the match needed more time to really like kick it into that next gear. And I did think the finish was a bit anticlimactic, all things considered, but Oh, this next oh, match. Boy. Wait a minute. This is an AEW show that doesn't feel bloated. Oh, wait. <laughs> here we go. A 10 man tag team attraction here. You have John Moxley, Wheeler Yuta, and Claudio representing the BCC teaming up with Kanosuke Takeshita and Shota Umino. Remember, Takeshita turned heel during Anarchy in the Arena, double or nothing. Taking on Hangman, the Young Bucks, Tomohiro Ishii. And Eddie Kingston returning to AEW after basically exiling himself to Ring of Honor for a while. Here he is teaming up with the Elite. And, man, this match was a lot of fun. But, again, it's like, how many 10-man tag team matches do I have to see on these shows? You know what? This is crazy because the Elite and the BCC has been an ongoing feud for a few months now. We saw Anarchy in the Arena. But Eddie Kingston single-handedly turned this into his feud because I feel like without Kingston, this match would have no substance whatsoever because a couple weeks ago on AEW, like you said, Eddie made his return. And if we all know one thing about Kingston, he fucking hates Claudio Castagnoli. Don't get me wrong. He hates the Young Bucks. He hates Adam Page. He hates Kenny Omega. He hates everybody, but he has a special hatred in his heart for Claudio Castagnoli. We've seen them feud over the years. We saw Eddie fail to capture the Ring of Honor World Championship live mm-hmm. um, at the Ring of Honor show. But his one of his best friends and John Moxley is teaming with Castagnoli. And Kingston ain't taking that shit. No. He basically tells Moxley, you ain't going to be friends with him or we're enemies, motherfucker. That's right. I love Eddie. I and love then when. So much. My favorite moment of this match, believe it or not, was the Eddie Kingston, John Moxley face off. Because when they saw these two friends look each other dead in the eye, like the crowd got to their feet because they knew this was history. Eddie Kingston was the guy that theoretically saved John Moxley from the failed exploding ring of <laughs> Kenny Omega a couple of years ago during the pandemic. Um, so they start exchanging blows. It's, I mean, it's a wild. 10-man brawl. What do you expect? The Young Bucks yeah. hit BTE triggers. Kanosuke Takeshita, I feel like, has uh, embraced this new heel role very well, even though he's using a lot of Sami Zayn's moves here and there. Blue Thunderbomb, Haluva Kick. He likes doing Sami Zayn moves, but... Yeah, you know. I just feel like there was so much going on in this match. The BCC, the Elite, the New Japan guys. Oh, by the way, Kingston hates Tomohiro Ishii too, but he's willing... <laughs> <laughs> to tolerate him in this match. God, he Does he really? Everybody, yeah. Don't you remember they wrestled at that one pay-per-view? Yeah, but I feel like that was more so like Eddie Kingston being like, yeah, oh, I want to <laughs> I wanna wrestle this guy. This is a dream Kingston match. Kingston doesn't like people. He tolerates them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you can say he's kind of like a likable Brock Lesnar in a way. Mm-hmm. Does not like people. He only tolerates them. <laughs> Barely yeah. tolerates them. Um. Tomohiro is she very stiff in this match as well. And he was actually the one that got the pin. Hangman Adam Page nails Wheeler Yuta with the buckshot lariat. Is she then hits a gigantic sheer drop of brain buster for the pinfall on Wheeler Yuta. This was a really fun 20 minute match or 21 minute match, something like that. Um, 
Yeah, 21 minutes. Um, good, yeah. good action. Good it, it action. Was good. Let me ask you something. How do you wrestle Ishii and not leave the match with either a broken limb or a concussion? Good question. Good question. Uh, very carefully is my yeah. answer. Uh, <laughs> so um, four stars. I was very entertained by this. And I, I'll give the match bonus points because I don't think John Moxley laid out a drop of blood in this match for a change. That was the thing. I was expecting this to be a 10-man war, but considering everything else we had on this card and we just got anarchy in the arena and we're going to get blood and guts. Yeah, I that's think, why. That's yeah. why there was no blood because, uh, you know, their war games is coming up practically. So they got to save all of that for uh, when the cage drops over two rings. I feel like you enjoyed this match a lot more than I did. Other than the Eddie Moxley, Casanova stuff, it was just another crazy spot fest. I'm going to give it three and a half. Oh, it's super um, entertaining. The Young Bucks are my favorite tag team, so it's always a pleasure to see them do their thing, and their tandem offense is always just so freaking awesome. Claudio, well, like I said, Claudio earlier, Eddie Kingston own. had great moments in this match, and it made me want to see a rematch at Death Before Dishonor, damn it. Maybe you want to see a rematch with Eddie Kingston yeah, at home. Tony Khan, if your plan is not to put the world title on Kingston, then you might as well just fire him now because might as he's well. one of the most overpaid people in AEW, and we don't see enough of him. No, no, not enough. Um, so Again, uh, someone forgot to tell Eddie that pro wrestling is fake. Because this guy... <laughs> God fucking, damn it. This is his life. God damn it. <laughs> Wrestling's not fake! Uh, but anyway... Um, up next, Tomas is one of your favorites. Oh, yes. I mean, people in the match. I love both of these people in the match. Um, the <laughs> AEW Women's World Championship, it is Tony Storm of the Outcast defending against the New Japan Strong Women's Champion, Willow Nightingale. Willow Nightingale got a huge upset win over Mercedes Monet to become the inaugural... Uh, yeah, the inaugural NJPW Strong Women's Champion. I don't give a shit that Mercedes Monet got injured during the match. Willow Nightingale deserved this title, and she deserves all the accolades that go with it. And now she's challenging for the AEW Women's World Championship. My first issue with this match is it doesn't feel very Forbidden Door. Like, no. Willow Nightingale is signed to AEW. Yeah, so, yeah she I is. Like you know what would have made this match a little bit more enticing and a little bit more, like, a big deal? Winner take all. I know Willow yeah. Nightingale kind of just won the belt. Tony Storm kind of sort of just won the belt at double or nothing. Why not put both belts on the line if both people in the match are champions? Why not? Yeah. You know? Yeah, and I feel like, uh, I mean, what, was Kyrie busy? They couldn't book her. I know Mercedes I mean, Monet is injured. I mean, yeah, they couldn't get Mercedes Monet either, but, you know. Well, I know there's not a lot of huge names, women's wise, in New Japan, but uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. This one felt very last minute thrown together. A lot of people were saying, you know what? But here's the thing. As appropriate as would have been, Mercedes Monet, Monet's first appearance in AEW, I don't want to be crammed in the middle of a crazy staff card like this. I feel like yeah. she deserves the main event of a dynamite oh totally or like second to last at a pay-per-view like a seven i know tony khan's not gonna do it but a solid eight match card and she goes like third to last yeah yeah I, i'm with you there maybe against soraya and actually bury soraya on the way but <laughs> i mean um yeah so the outcasts are on the outside of the ring they don't really play much of a factor to my uh to my knowledge um <clears throat> Willow Nightingale is so freaking over with her and her Death Valley driver. Um, Willow has an Indian Deathlock submission. This is a really solid match, dude. Uh, there it's was fun. a there was a Death Valley driver on the apron for Tony Storm. Love Tony Storm to pieces, but please do not kill yourself on some of these moves. Like my word, <laughs> my word. These two ladies are stiff. Willow Nightingale mm -hmm. may not look like it, but she is stiff. Mm hmm. She hits a gigantic pounds on tony storm to knock her out of the ring you know uh, who she reminds me of who bailey willow and oh yeah bailey uh -huh. yeah yeah no, I, like, can, I can see that comparison you know what willow nightingale would break <clears throat> your arm but i'd also like to go to disneyland with her 
Right? Oh my god. <laughs> I'd like to go to Rope Drop with Willow Nightingale and ride Peter yeah. Pan's Flight. Or exactly. Haunted Mansion, you know? <laughs> like, I wonder She's what Willow Nightingale's favorite Disneyland ride is, but um, a really solid match between two <laughs> solid women's workers. Um, Tony Storm hits a very impressive Storm Zero after uh, distracting the referee for a bit. Solid 11-minute match. Tony Storm pins and retains three stars i enjoyed it i enjoyed yeah. it for what it was it was fun but this is when again the typical aew burnout starts to happen and again this is match number what six mm -hmm. and we only have, we have like five matches left to go um, yeah uh -huh. but yeah i enjoyed this again it just didn't feel very forbidden door and yeah. you know what i would gladly save my energy from this match because what we had next <sighs> In a match a lot of people are calling the 2023 match of the year so far. For the IWGP United States Heavyweight Championship, it is Kenny Omega defending against the aerial assassin Will Ospreay. In a rematch from Wrestle Kingdom earlier this year where Omega beat Ospreay for the title, people all over the world have been claiming that as one of the greatest matches they've ever seen in their life. And it's a great match. But honestly, this match could have topped it. This match it could have was, much topped it. Will Osprey so Osprey gets match. an epic entrance. He's looking back at old footage of Omega beating the crap out of him at Wrestle Kingdom, and he's this is such a simple narrative. You don't need a whole bunch of video packages to tell you the history of what's going on here. If you watch that Wrestle Kingdom match, you don't need a video package. You know the history, but they gave Osprey <laughs> a great package. Yeah, um, before we get into what happens well into the next entrance, I forgot to mention the commentary team. We had Excalibur, Taz for the first half of the show, who swapped out with Tony Schiavone after Taz stormed off, and Kevin Kelly. Kevin mm -hmm. Kelly is my favorite commentator in professional wrestling. His stuff in Ring of Honor and New Japan Pro Wrestling, he could carry a whole show by himself. And I was Joey so Styles happy to see him style. on the show. <laughs> absolutely oh yeah no, which i think I... he does like on the american totally side, oh he, he totally does by himself. Mm -hmm. yeah you know and oh we'll get into joey styles on another podcast and my adoration for him but um omega and osprey go out there don Callis is in osprey's corner and uh omega the... comes out and he is introduced as the best bout machine his old gimmick from new japan they went mm -hmm. full on new japan for this match they sure did I... I thought my body was ready for this match, but it wasn't because <laughs> you don't say, okay, to put things into perspective, I haven't been so emotionally drained from match since Roman Reigns and Jey Uso from hell in a cell 2020. Really? And that match drained me. Oh, this was the personification of storytelling. This Story match this match obviously is going to get five stars from me. I don't want to jump the gun too much, but these guys got nearly 40 minutes to go out there. And the difference between a match like this and a match like Triple H and Shawn Michaels, which got nearly 50 minutes inside Hell in a Cell. Hey, this match works carefully. This match never got boring or slow. Like these guys were constantly, I know I, I, I said it just for you, Tomas, but these guys were just like 40 minutes straight. And there were so many clever callbacks. The crowd was giving Don Callis shit on the outside, which you always love to hear. They were chanting, fuck you, Don. The referee immediately ejects Don Callis from ringside, which, which will play into something we'll talk about in a bit. But so Osprey and, Callis had these two like security goons with them. And I was a little scared because I'm like, ah, are we going to get a lot of interference in this match? No, early on in the match, Callis does interfere before he gets before he gets ejected. Omega chases him up the ramp, but he realizes that security is not for Osprey. It's for Callis. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure is. Sure is. Um, but these two guys, what do you want me to say about this? These guys have impeccable chemistry with one another. Omega attempts a snapdragon suplex and Osprey lands on his fucking feet. And I'm like, Will Osprey is the freaking man. Like, Sir, some things earlier in the match, too, that I want to point out. I, 
you know, I'm always the guy to say, save the blood for the big matches. And this match 100% warranted the blood very early on in this match. Mm-hmm. They were fighting. The first act of this match was Osprey just beating the holy hell out of Omega, basically getting his revenge from Wrestle Kingdom. And it was a callback. And this spot was nasty. I'm surprised no one's talking about it more. Yeah. He takes Omega's head and drives it through the announce table. Mm-hmm. Like Omega doesn't put his arms up. He doesn't put his hands up and slaps the canvas or slaps the top of the announce table. No. Osprey drives Omega's head straight through the table. God and that damn. Oh, so gnarly. And then he takes Omega's head again and he props up like the stand, the covering for the, the announce table against like the apron and he drives his head through that and i'm just like oh my god like these guys are the masters of selling mm-hmm, mm-hmm. they sure are omega bleeding immensely after this whole sequence will osprey has kenny omega draped over the top rope like a freaking like towel being left out to dry after a shower and <laughs> osprey leaps off the top rope Shooting star press on Omega while he's draped on the top rope. I was like, <laughs> I was in love with this match from like, I mean, if the reversal out of the Snapdragon wasn't enough to make me fall in love with this match <laughs> at this point, I'm like, I'm fully in this. Let's freaking go. Um, So Osprey, you know, he's dominating a good portion of the match. Um, There were... These guys spent a good two minutes on the floor because it should be noted, this is under New Japan Pro Wrestling rules. Instead of a 10 count, you get a 20 count on the outside of the ring, which is key to note because these guys had so much outside brawling. You had Omega going through the announce table head first, like uh, Tomas was referring to. Uh, Osprey has some of Omega's blood on his bicep. And this fucker drinks the blood. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm like, oh, this is a this is a personal blood feud, and uh, the crowd's uh, in turn chants "You sick fuck" at Osprey, and they're having so no. fun with this. You you want to know why they were chanting "You sick fuck"? Because not only did Osprey drink Omega's blood, he drank it and he said, "Tasty." Yeah, and then the crowd chanted "You sick fuck." Osprey looks out towards them and he's like, "I am." <laughs> So this was kind of a gimmicky spot, but it kind of led back into Omega getting his heat back. For some reason, Osprey started taunting these kids in the front row. And then there was this man holding a Canadian flag, and Osprey takes the Canadian flag, immediately just starts doing the thing where he's like rubbing it up against like, you know, his nether regions. He twists up the flag and sticks it up his nose, Chris Jericho style. Mm-hmm. And Shawn Michaels just, style from 97. Style, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Man. Shawn Michaels style. And then he takes the flag and starts choking Omega with it. Mm-hmm. Omega, Omega returns the favor and chokes Osprey with the flag. And it's so weird because <laughs> Osprey took the took the flag from an adult man in the crowd, does the gimmick with it in front of the kids, and then Omega gives this man's flag to the kids who are like, I don't know, like 20 seats away from where it was initially. I'm like, give this guy the flag back. That's his flag. Yeah, also, you know, blood and snot and ball sweat all over this flag now. Mm-hmm. Never watch that flag ever again. <laughs> Fucking. Oh my God. Okay. Another thing about this match. It's got everything you could ever want, including for me, stolen fucking finishers. <laughs> stolen oh, yeah. we'll, fucking we'll, finishers. We'll, we'll get into that, but this is when Omega really starts getting his heat back, and he hits a gnarly DDT on a standing oh. steel steps on the outside. Um, also, go, let's go back to the choking of the flag real quick. This was New Japan rules, so to the referee's discretion, they are allowed to push the rule, and that's the thing that I like. They were allowed to push the envelope a little with the rules, but there were no weapon shots in this match. There were no low blows in this match. There was no noticeable oh. interference. This wasn't like a WCW show. This was, we're going to let them fight. We're going to, you know, let them bend the rules a little. God, it's such fantastic near falls as well. Osprey hit Omega with a Spanish fly. And again, Roman Reigns may be the master of kicking out a 2.99999. Kenny Omega has mastered that art as well. Um, there were Ooh. so many spots where I was like, man, 
<laughs> man that should have been the finish but i want to get into a very awkward spot and i'm wondering if i'm the only person that noticed Ooh. it oh you know exactly what i'm talking about yep so, so um, um are, are you talking about the submissions are you talking yeah, about the submissions Ospreay. so osprey locks in the sharpshooter in canada yeah the crowd is sitting there and it's like oh man this is sean and brett all over again are they gonna screw him but no and then, he transitions out of the sharpshooter he goes into the fucking crippler crossface and the crowd okay. you sick fuck you sick fuck no here's what got move. me he immediately goes into the crossface and i'm sitting there and i go oh and then you just hear you know the crowd is super into this match and then you just hear this faint everything goes down and it gets awkwardly quiet and then the booze start, and I'm just like, I'm sitting there like, okay, Osprey, I don't know if he intentionally did that. I don't know. If he intent, there's getting heat, and then there's that. They they are in Canada, after all. They I are know, in Canada. But th there's got to be a line. Yeah. And oh, I man. don't know if Osprey intentionally crossed that line. But Good Lord. Let's just say the crowd noticed. <laughs> They oh yeah <clears throat> oh yeah all the submission holes would go for it you well they were in canada you know? <laughs> so yeah osprey counters omega leading into a liger bomb there's an oz cutter for a great near fall also then the here here's my issue with the match i'm gonna be that fucker that nitpicks why is don Callis allowed to come back out to ringside he was ejected Callus comes back, and then the commentators immediately say, Callus is risking Osprey getting disqualified. Also, in New Japan rules, you can lose the title via disqualification. Even though Osprey is a challenger, you mm -hmm. still lose the match. And I, I do agree with you there, and I was really worried because the next spot really left a sour taste in my mouth. Um, Osprey is able to... No, was it one of those... Okay, so... Okay, what was the web? Oh, yes, it's the screwdriver. So mm -hmm. Osprey gets to the ropes, and as the referee is backing Omega off, Callus gives Osprey the screwdriver. And then Callus goes, classic spot. Callus starts distracting the referee. Omega goes for the one winged angel, and Osprey stabs Omega with the screwdriver. Yeah. Goes for the pin. And I'm like, God, they're really going to fucking end this match like this. Yeah. One, two. Oh, no, he hits Stormbreaker, too. Yes, he One, does. Two, Omega gets his foot on the rope. Oh, it was so freaking brilliant. It was so freaking brilliant, wasn't it? But I, I was sitting here and I was like, why, again, why is Don Callis out here? Like, the referee needs to make an effort to enforce his rule and get him out of the arena. Referee never acknowledged him again. Referee <laughs> never acknowledged him. Um, But <laughs> this is the spot that everybody's talking about. Osprey nails kenny omega with omega's own move the one winged angel and o osprey hit it really nicely as well goes for the pin one omega hooks up and terminates and kicks out <laughs> and i'm like omega's I gonna beat him i liked it i love that spot yeah no, people it, didn't like it i loved it reminded me of the young bucks omega page tag team match where omega kicked out at one after someone stole one of his moves um the crowd freaking came alive for that spot Omega makes a comeback. He hits a V trigger. Um, but then Osprey hits one more hidden blade elbow. Tiger Driver 91, which drops Omega right on his fucking head. And Omega what? still kicks up. He's still fucking. <laughs> Omega is literally the Terminator, man. So um, Omega is hitting Osprey with these V triggers. And these are the nastiest sounding V triggers I ever heard in my life. Mm -hmm. And before he hits the last one, he looks right at Don Callis and he said, this one's got your fucking name on it. And mm -hmm. this reminds me of Brock Lesnar and Paul Heyman circa 2003. That should be Omega's goal going from here on out. Hit Don Callis with a V-trigger. Mm -hmm. um, he hits enough V-triggers, but it's not enough to pin Osprey. One more Stormbreaker, and Will Osprey is the brand new IWGP US Heavyweight Champion. Five stars. Five stars, man. This was Loved 40 it. 40 minutes of just pure, unadulterated storytelling. <laughs> love this match. Like, this was incredible. Incredible. I, I loved it. If it would have ended with the callous spot, it would have got four and three quarter. Mm -hmm. But that rope break spot, the kicking out of one of the one winged angel, the kick out of the Tiger Driver 91, it, it, it just kept getting better and better and better. 
And allow me to break this immersion by saying, why would you let a tiger drive? God damn you. God damn you. Why would, <laughs> why would you let a storm break? Why would you let a storm break? Huh? Why would an angel be one winged? <laughs> God damn it. You got me. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Good. Good. That's what you get. Um, five stars. Love this match. Joking aside. This was worth the pay-per-view alone. This mm -hmm. was 40 minutes of just... If, if, you, if you have a friend that st that isn't wants to give pro wrestling a shot, don't show them this match. Mm -hmm. yeah. This was amazing. <laughs> so... I can't put into words how beautiful this match was. And this may be my favorite match of the year. Yeah. <sighs> This was you know, awesome. It is very tight between this match and MJF and Danielson, a revolution from my favorite AEW match all year. I'm giving the edge to MJF and Danielson only because of the Don Callis stuff and the referee not, you know, enforcing the rule enough. Mm -hmm. um, MJF can get away with that more, you know, because he's a heel. This may be my match of the year. <clears throat> you were talking to somebody that was in the crowd for Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens versus the Usos. And who was in the crowd for that Iron Man match. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> freaking crazy, man. But, oh, so freaking awesome. Like, my other problem, this match should have gone on last. This should have been the main event. But, I mean... The more I look at it, the more I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. This definitely should have gone on last. This is... I have said in the past that I feel like Tony Khan's favorite wrestling pay-per-view was WrestleMania 18. Because he saw Rock and Hogan. I believe he was there live as well. But this had a very WrestleMania 18 feel. Omega and Osprey go out there and they tear the house down. The crowd is completely alive for everything. You still got two more freaking matches. You know? And the crowd is just so freaking deathly quiet. Especially for this next match, Tomas. Which a lot of people were excited to see. Mainly for one interaction that's never happened before. But... Aside from that, not really a whole lot to write home about with this one, sadly. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. This was your piss break. <laughs> this was your piss break. It's your obligatory Sting and Darby Allen six-man tag team match. Sting, Darby Allen, and Tetsuya Naito versus mm -hmm. Les Suzuki guys. I don't know if that's their official name or not. That's Chris Jericho, Sammy Guevara, and Minoru Suzuki. Let me get the positives out of the way right now. Los Sting Gobernables. Yes. Also, I love Suzuki gods. The, their charisma is so great. You wouldn't think <clears> so. <throat> Three random people like Jericho, Suzuki, and Guevara. But so weird. They worked together the past couple weeks on AEW. And <laughs> I just got to help but laugh when they did the pose together. It was, I, I took a screenshot of my TV and I saved that photo and I'm just like, so uh, I need that screenshot so I can send it to people randomly who are wrestling oh, yeah. fans and be like, yeah. Oh, yes. I, I, I sent it to a person that me and you both know <clears throat> and she just said, why? <laughs> and you know what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um. So Darby Allen and Minoru Suzuki have a stiff encounter. They just stare each other down and Darby's like, because he has no fear. This guy's planning to climb up Mount Everest next year with his will in case the fucker dies up there. He, he goes up to Minoru Suzuki, one of the stiffest workers of all time, and he says, hit me as hard as you fucking can. And S Suzuki obliges. He says, yeah, Suzuki says, okay. <laughs> okay. You're not going to make to Everest, little kid. Yeah, I've, I've never um, wrestled a kid on the playground before. The only other thing that was worth mentioning in this match is that this is a forwarding of the Chris Jericho, Sammy Guevara story that, you know, teasing the tension between them because Jericho barking orders at Guevara telling him, go do a 450, go do it right now, or go do a 630 off the top rope. And Guevara's like, you don't tell me what to do. And But yeah. he does it and he puts Sting through a table, which Sting, stop it. Oh, did, that it. that didn't look good. That didn't look good. Please. Um, Sting had a Scorpion Deathlock uh, applied to Jericho, which I should note, I was excited to see Sting and Jericho interact because they had never interacted before with each other in any company. Not WCW, not WWE. Yeah. Eh. 
<laughs> it's different, okay? It's mm-hmm. different. It's a match I've never seen before, so... There's a lot of matches <clears throat> I haven't seen before. Sting and The Undertaker? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've never seen... Fuck you, Vince. Will Ospreay versus Seth Rollins. <sighs> Will Ospreay versus AJ Styles. Anyway, uh... Yeah, there's a lot so... of other matches I'd rather see. Yeah. So... <laughs> uh sting goes into the ring illegally and uh he hits a lariat on suzuki naito rolls through and he sits on top of minaru suzuki and it's an average batch the f- baby faces win after 15 minutes um it was better than the punk match i liked it more than the punk match yeah it, it was all right i'll give it two and a half stars it was a spare it was your piss break match it was it's your obligatory yeah. Sting and Darby Allen match, like I said. And at this point, I was just like, can we just get to the main event, please? Which is a dream match of all dream matches, a match that I'm sure Tomas would have wanted to see more than Sting versus Chris Jericho. It is Kazuchika Okada versus Brian Danielson. One-on-one, all about pride here. Danielson, of course, is a heel from the Blackpool Combat Club. But... <laughs> But, uh, oh boy, Danielson did not come off like a heel on this night, did he? He walks out to the ring, and the final countdown is playing. Tony Khan paid out the ass to get Danielson to walk out to final countdown for one night only. This is the this is the theme that Danielson walked out to many a times on a Ring of Honor show. His, his farewell, Ring of Honor, was... So, like it was subtitled the final countdown because this song and Danielson were so synonymous with one another before Danielson became famous with WWE. So to hear him come out to that song, it was almost like I was having an out of body experience. I was like, am I listening to this? <laughs> am I hearing this right? You know, you know, I don't have any personal memories with Danielson coming out to that song, but when it happened, I'm like, this just feels right. It's so freaking cool. So freaking cool. And then the coin drops and you know exactly what happens. The crowd pops. Okada walks to the ring. I forget that Okada dwarfs Danielson by a good margin. Okada's a tall, lanky individual. But damn, is he good at this pro wrestling thing. Him and Danielson go out there and they have a very technically sound main event, as you would expect from two of the best in the world. The crowd chants, holy shit, and this is awesome, before the two even lock horns. And these guys got 27 minutes, plenty of time for a big-time main event. Um, Yeah, all things considered, because Danielson wrestled half of this match with the broken arm. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm Mm-hmm. Have we mentioned that uh, Brian Danielson slash Daniel Bryan is a badass on this podcast before? Yeah. He's also held together by paper clips and glue. (laughs) anyway uh so danielson cattle mutilation the crowd also chants you're gonna get your fucking head kicked in this felt like i don't know about you tomas but this felt like an old style mid-2000s ring of honor main event just with the crowd interaction the final countdown okada's in the ring with him and danielson is back to the danielson of old like obviously you know he's graying a little bit he's an older brian danielson but he can still freaking go. Danielson's oh, one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. So it's, ah, uh, this, this was awesome. This was so, 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 so awesome. Danielson running cross body blocks all over the place. Okada air raid neck breakers. Um, good freaking, uh, Danielson locks in the yes lock and Okada gets his feet on the ropes for the break. And Tomas is not correcting me on the yes lock, which is good. Uh, it's, it's the, it's the yes lock. It's the same thing. Uh, so, um, Okada wanted a rainmaker. Danielson continually finds ways to escape the rainmaker, which is another great story. Um, Oh, God. Okada catches Danielson with a pile driver on the ramp. Did you, like, leap out of your seat because Danielson is held together by super glue? Yeah. Taking a bump like that on the floor. I mean, Danielson takes these bumps that he doesn't need to. To be fair, Stone Cold Steve Austin also did not need to take the bumps that he did at Mania last year with Kevin Owens. Like, I. Yeah, fair. Suplex lost... on the concrete. <laughs> With a stack of necks, you call a dime. What? Uh, so, 
Um, Danielson hits a running knee, two count, and then Danielson finally gets up and he says, it's time to kick his fucking head in. And I, I should actually, you know, I should do a more accurate impression. He's holding his arm like this. It's time to kick his fucking head. Like, because like Tomas said, I don't remember exactly when it happened. You might have to remind me. Danielson fractured his arm. Mm-hmm. He's out for about two months. Ah, but did that stop him from finishing this match? Of course not. Seventeen of course minutes not. more of the match? Absolutely not. Of course not, because it's Brian Danielson. He is kicking Okada's face in, and then oh man, this is where Okada finally hits the rainmaker, and you get a near fall there. It just again, it's just freaking awesome. But name another person with a more devastating clothesline than Okada. Uh, JBL today (laughs) (laughs) yikes um so finally danielson locks in the yes lock barely and it's about 25 (laughs) i know what i said uh he locks in the yes lock and it's you know like like 25 minutes deep into the match danielson's arm is practically hanging off of his shoulder he can barely move it and i'm like how is he gonna lock in the yes lock with with a broken arm you know but it's brian danielson he finds a way to do it and he is like innovating the yes lock to no end. He is pulling Okada's arm every which way. He's using his, uh, Danielson's using his own legs to his advantage in the submission. But then you finally get back to the traditional LaBelle lock and Okada taps out. Okada taps out. That was the shocker of the night for me. Yeah. That was yeah. the shocker of the night. Clearly, it shocked a lot of people in Toronto in the building because I was looking around. There were people in the front row who I don't know how they do this. They're on their phone. They're on their phone. And, like, Danielson has the yes lock in there, and they have no idea that Okada tapped out, and they missed it. They spent all that money, and they missed the freaking finish. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Yeah, absolutely. But, Sorry, um, phone call interrupting me. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, This match... Four and three quarter stars. I thought the finish was a bit anticlimactic. I liked o- Omega Osprey more, but I think it's all going to come down to personal tastes as which one you think is better. But this one, I feel like lived up to the hype. I'm going to go with four and a half stars. Um, I'm okay. Be the guy at first. I was going to say I think Okada should have went over because if you notice on the show, AEW demolished New Japan and Survivor Series 2018 uh, syndrome yeah. here. So. I feel like this should have been New Japan's big, big moment. Like, if they're going to lose all the other matches, they can at least win the main event. But then I was reminded of something. This is not the end. Danielson and Okada are going to have another match. We don't know when. We don't know where. But this match is going to happen. Okada will get his win back. Wrestle just, Kingdom, maybe? Uh, yeah, I was just genuinely shocked. Yeah. Danielson not only won, but he made Okada tap out. Which Clean. is only the second time in his career he has ever tapped out. Yeah. What was the first time? I don't remember. I don't know, honestly. Man, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a piece of trivia that we're going to need in the uh, in the comments down there, but. Exactly, yeah. Also, it just reminds me of, like, the only times John Cena's ever tapped out clean was to Kurt Angle and to, was it just Angle? It might have been just Angle. Yeah, yeah. Kurt Angle's the only one to ever make John Cena tap out clean. Kurt Angle's the only one to ever make John Cena tap out clean. He's the only one to ever make The Undertaker tap out. Only one to ever make Kane tap out. I want to make Hulk Hogan tap out. Clean, you know. Mm-hmm. Sting did not make Hulk Hogan tap out at Stark 97 before a uh, screw job finish. But, I mean, yeah. Beside Anywho. the point, Okada doesn't yeah, tap out very often. It's a once in a blue moon opportunity to see Kazuchika Okada give up in the middle of the ring. So it was really, really great main event to cap off what I think is another great show for AEW. I'm giving this a nine out of 10. Um, if you, yeah, nine out of 10 for Tomas as well. Love me some forbidden door. Keep it coming. If you want to put it overseas to Japan after the idea grows a little bit more over these next couple of years, hell I'm all for it. I'm all for a different feeling forbidden door pay-per-view. This was so much fun. Like I said, I feel like this show kind of crept up on me and I had so much fun watching it. AEW, please get that streaming service down, that streaming deal down. I don't care if it's with Max. I don't care who it's with because I want to be able to go back and watch these shows whenever I want. And this was such a damn good show. 
again, I loved Okada Danielson. I loved Sonata Jungle Boy. I loved Osprey Omega. I loved MJF and Tanahashi. There was so much good matches on the show. And there wasn't a match on the show that I really disliked. Even the six-man tag that I poked fun at, it was just, I was tired at that point. There were some of these matches that were placed very awkwardly. Like I said, this was not a perfect show, but it was so damn fun. Nine out of ten. Super fun. Yeah, it's definitely one of the strongest shows you're going to see this year. Right up there with Revolution, right up there with WrestleMania, which both those shows Tomas and I were at. Um, there was been a flash. Yeah, no, it's it's been a really strong year for pay-per-views. Royal Rumble and the Chamber were both freaking awesome. Um, I mean, the weakest show of the year so far, like, is double or nothing. And that was even a solid night of wrestling. But, um, yeah, no, I mean, it's going to be it's gonna be interesting to see where AEW goes from here with a new show on Saturday. Um, it's a very content-heavy right now. But, guys, thank you so much, as always, for tuning in. Smash that subscribe button. Let's see if we can get to 2,000 before the end of the year. And what's next for us? Next weekend is Money in the Bank. Mm-hmm. In so that's going to be really fun. We're going to watch that show. And obviously, we're going to give our thoughts on that. Uh, then we got SummerSlam. We got All Out and All In to talk about. And, of course, we got the Royal Rumble 2005 to talk about. Mm-hmm. We're going to get on this, man. Yeah, Royal Rumble 05. I think we can fit No Way Out 05 in somewhere there. But, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be a fun summer over here with uh, the ZNT tandem. Uh, you got anything else for the viewers? Uh, no, just like... Keep a lookout for all of our future reviews. You know, a lot of wrestling coming up this summer. I'm hyped for Money in the Bank. I'm hyped for everything. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, commence that back talk, my friends. Let us know what you thought of Forbidden Door. And uh, see you guys next time.